your reputation in your hands. You could lose your job. You could lose your friends. People didn't talk about this, but what happened? We got better at treating breast cancer. More people survived and they talked about their experience. And they said, well, you know what, I don't think I want this. And maybe I don't want a radical mastectomy. Maybe I just want you know, a lumpectomy with radiation. And so they inserted these cells into the treatment, and that disease came into the public's understanding as a disease. To the point, today, to have breast cancer is to not be ashamed. In fact, Delta Airlines has a whole Boeing 757 painted in pink li ribbons to celebrate breast cancer survival. And what I want to know is, what color are we going to paint our pain, plane 20 years from now? <laughs> because the disease is starting right before our very eyes to come into the public's imagination. You're starting to see people write about addiction, write about their recovery, not all of what they're writing and, and uh, singing about and, and uh, making writing plays about is, is of high quality, but it gives voice to the addict's experience. It shows the entire breadth from Amy Winehouse to you know, people who have 40 years in recovery, the entire experience. And I, I hope that that's what we'll see in the next 20 years as the ontogeny of addiction starts to really develop. We'll see a renaissance of literature and poetry and music and theater and painting that gives voice, that expresses the entire range of addiction and recovery because it is a beautiful, beautiful human story and it is a very American story, I think. So. Let's dive into some of this science, and I'll show you how addiction fits that, that model. If the most important question about addiction, and I believe it is, is, is it even a disease? The most important answer is yes, it's a brain disease, and we didn't get two steps out of the gate, and already we're in trouble. <laughs> because if I want to be honest with you, we don't know a lot about the brain in, in medicine. Now, we've learned a lot recently, but relative to other organs like the pancreas and the femur, we are largely in the dark. This is probably the greatest puzzle in the universe. So it is a hard organ, many, many times more hard than the pancreas and the femur, okay? And so people with brain diseases, they start out at a bit of a disadvantage, right? Um, we're more likely to look at their behavior and attribute it to badness than to a disease process. One of the consequences of the brain being just so hard is that we don't have good tests for brain diseases the way we do pancreas and femur diseases. If I'm not sure if a person really has a broken leg or not, you just get an x-ray. If I'm not sure if a person has true diabetes or maybe just a little glucose intolerance, well, I've got a very good test. It's called a two-hour glucose tolerance test. I can nail it down to the number. But we don't have x-rays and blood tests for things like major depression or schizophrenia. Why? Because those things aren't diseases? No, it's just because we're not quite that good at the brain level. Most of the tests that we do have for brain diseases are these rather lousy, projective tests, highly <laughs> culturally biased. I mean, the Rorschach is one of the great stinkers in the history of medical testing, but unfortunately, I I it's all we've got. Now, we, we, we do know a little bit about the brain, and most of the little bit that we do know about the brain came from patients like this. Patients who survived some severe brain injury, okay? If you pick up a popular text on the brain today, you will come across this case. It's the case of Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker. He worked about 150 years ago, and he camped dynamite down in holes dug for it, and one day on the job, I guess he just camped a little too hard, and the dynamite exploded, and it drove his steel rod through his skull that took this path, and it ended up 100 feet behind him. Now, most patients with, with this kind of brain injury um, die, all right? <laughs> brain is not real tolerant to this kind of thing. But see, this is the beauty of, of my area, public health. We deal with big numbers. And so if 99.99% .99 of all people with this kind of brain injury die, that means that every now and then someone lives. You patch them up together, and they don't get an infection. They don't bleed to death. And these people who, by some miracle, survive their brain injuries, they are worth their weight in gold to the field of neurology. Because what you can do is you can take a plain film of the skull and you can see that there's some big chunk of brain missing. We don't know what it means, but we can see that it's missing. And then you can wheel the patient into the room, and you can ask them, okay, what can't you do? <laughs> <laughs> and if they can't walk, that's how you know that that's the motor section of the brain. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not much more complex than that. 
C can you see you don't really need a bedside manner for public health, so I'm actually <laughs> pretty good with it. <laughs> so it was from these brain injury patients that we learned the first big thing about the brain, and that was that it tends to localize its functions in certain areas. And this is how we were able to make a basic map of what handles what in the brain. And right away it was obvious that there was a very interesting part of the brain up front here called the frontal cortex. Now the frontal cortex is a strange spot because it handles something that's hard to describe. It doesn't handle something easy like a movement or a sight or a sound. What does the frontal cortex handle? Well, it basically handles you. This is where you are. This is where I am. Everything that makes us us resides here. Everything we hold dear, all that our parents taught us. This is the part of the brain that is the closest thing to the seat of the self or the personality that we know of. And it's also the part of the brain where we do a lot of the things that we really like ourselves for as a species. And the reason that the frontal cortex can do all this stuff is that it is the part of the brain where we confer meaning, emotional meaning, onto the objects that enter our world. Very early on in the human story, it was a big survival advantage to gather in groups. And one of the things that you need to gather in groups is the ability to attach to our children, to our partners, to God. This is where we do that. And so it is not unfair to say that it is in the frontal cortex that a mother loves her child. This is where this woman confers meaning, deep, personal, emotional, dare I say spiritual meaning onto her baby and the role of motherhood. Frontal cortex. This is where we love mom back. This is where we select our romantic partners and our friends. So this is the social part of the brain. This is where we have a notion of our place in our family. This is where we make things morally meaningful. What's right? What's wrong? So it's the law-abiding part of the brain. And it's also the part of the brain where we make things spiritually meaningful. So perhaps you can see how the belief arose that, OK, if the frontal cortex is the thinking, decent, law-abiding, mor moral, spiritual choice brain, then this must be the part of the brain that's damaging those addicts. Because everybody knows that addicts are liars, cheats, and thieves, that they have this addict personality, that their parents messed up. So drugs must have somehow come along and broken this part of the brain and created all this nasty, addictive behavior. And it's a powerful idea that drugs work in the thinking, decent, law-abiding, moral, spiritual choice frontal cortex. There's only one problem with that idea. It's wrong. I mean, it's just flat out wrong. It turns out that drugs do not exert their primary influence in the frontal cortex. Where do they work? Deeper down, in a much older part of the brain called the midbrain. Now, the midbrain is not our thinking, decent, law-abiding brain. This is our survival brain. It doesn't handle what we're going to do in an hour or in a week. It handles the next 15 seconds. It doesn't make choices. It simply acts to save our life. Okay? It gets us from moment to moment alive. And so everything that we see and hear and taste and touch, all that sensory information, it comes in, but before it ever goes up to the cortex, the midbrain gets first crack at that arriving sensory data. Because for everything that enters our world, let's say a podium, I have to process that very quickly on the level of life and death. And so this information comes in, the podium, comes into my midbrain. Before it ever goes up here, it comes here, and the midbrain tells me, what am I going to do with the podium on the level of life and death? Am I going to eat the podium? Am I going to kill the podium? Am I going to, all right, well, what am I going to do with the podium? <laughs> it's a much shorter list. <laughs> now, <laughs> here's the problem. <laughs> if I really want to describe the midbrain to you, if I really want to give you a feel for just how powerful this part of the brain is, it's hard to use words like this and really do the midbrain justice. You must understand, the midbrain is a very basic, very survival, very vulgar part of the brain, but critically important for moment-to-moment -moment life. And so if I say that the midbrain handles eat, I don't mean it handles let's sit down and break bread. I mean it handles eat. Eat now. Eat everything you can. <laughs> because tomorrow there might not be any food. And if those people over there have food, then kill them and eat their food. <laughs> The midbrain does not handle the concept make love, all right? That, that's up here, all right? Midbrain handles something much more basic, much more vulgar, much more critical to survival. 
And so, again, it's hard to describe the midbrain in 